is this. One time years ago in Omaha, Nebraska, I was to supply the pulpit in a Protestant church. I got there a little bit early in time for the Sunday school, and so they asked me if I would be willing to teach the Sunday school class of these young couples, about 30 of them there, 15 or so couples. I said I'd be glad to, and I got some papers, and I distributed them to the people, and I asked them to do one thing for me. Write down on the paper, what is the heart of Christianity? Not this truth or that truth or the other truth, but what is the gospel? What's the very central message of the Christian religion? What's the good news? Just write in your own language, sign the paper if you want, it doesn't matter to me. You just tell me what you as individual professing young Christians in a church where the pastor was a very faithful minister of the Word understood the heart of the Christian religion to be. Now, I got about 30 replies back. 28 of those told me about the golden rule, the going the second mile, the loving people, the doing good to people, and so on. All of the things they mentioned, not lying, being honest, fair, kind, and so on. Every one of them was a teaching of the Christian religion. But there were only two in that group who said anything at all about salvation by grace, who even mentioned the good news. What they were talking about was simply this duty and that duty and the other, but that they were justified by faith alone, the real heart of the religion, that were saved by Christ laying down His life, washing away his, our guilt in His blood, that got on two out of 30 papers, that particular type of thing. Now, mind you, that was a conservative church, conservative pastor in the pulpit. Boy, I, I take a minute to say something. At one time, I had my father-in-law, who was an evangelical pastor, visiting with us, and he got into a conversation with our next-door neighbor, who was a member of the church of which I was the pastor. And since the conversation went on right under my study window, I couldn't help hearing it. And you know what I heard? I heard my parishioner, who had been sitting under my instruction for about two years, telling my father-in-law that salvation was by works. And when my father-in-law tried to tell him about the gospel, he said, oh, no, 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 no. I had been teaching the gospel. I had thought I had articulated it clearly and emphatically. And you know me because I wasn't teaching anything essentially different then than I'm now. With you and so on, I would never have given anybody the impression that he's saved by doing this and doing that and doing the other thing, but by trust in Christ alone, though he'd do all those other things. And there is the man with great conviction telling my father-in-law at the heart of the gospel is the doing this and doing that, just as if he were an arch-liberal, and he had learned that from my father-in-law, son-in-law, so on. There you are, see. How easy it is to go into the liberal pattern on this matter. So I'm saying to you, as I presume are mostly conservative people listening to these tapes, ask yourself, what are you trusting in? What do you understand the gospel to be? So much for liberalism. Let's look at antinomianism before we finish this part of the lecture here. Antinomianism has this particular pattern. Faith brings justification minus works. We call this officially antinomianism because it means against the lawism. It means it's against the idea of the works of the law or the acts of obedience being uh, necessary. It's called easy believism because believing in Christ, you are justified without doing anything at all. And that you are justified at this moment, even if you never do a good work in your entire life. Now, this, you understand, is not only not liberal, it is anti-liberal. These people are fundamentalists always. They believe in real faith. 
They believe in a virgin-born Son of God who shed His blood for the remission of sins, and they are singing constantly about there being power in the blood and all those glorious, emphatic statements in music and in testimony and so on that Jesus died, and we glory in the cross, and our salvation is by Him alone. And nothing in my hands I bring it will make you feel very, very good because these people get the message about Christ and faith in Jesus Christ, and they recognize that that brings justification. You don't contribute anything to it, you see. It's Christ with whom you're united by faith who is the justifier. Nothing in my, oh, they love that hymn, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. These people are fundamentalists, they're evangelicals, they believe all the things that liberalism rejects. And as such, they're our brothers of ours, but at the same, and sisters, but at the same time, minus works. Now here again, we have to understand what that means. That doesn't mean that the works refer to serving Christ, preaching Christ, spreading the gospel about Christ, trying to win people to Christ, doing good for people, etc. All the acts, that, this particular thing, they're talking about works just all the rest of us talk about. Honesty and integrity and kindness and going the second mile and so on. But when they say minus here, they don't mean they're hostile to them. They don't mean that it's wrong to practice them. But what they mean is that though you ought to practice them, and it's a duty to practice them, and that you'll get a reward if you practice them, and that if you don't practice them, you'll be saved so as by fire, and you'll really be embarrassed before the judgment seat of Christ, but you'll be saved without them. That they will say. So understand me here. They're not against works. In a sense, they're for them, and many of them work. Why do they roll up their sleeves? They really labor for the advancement of the gospel as they know it, but what they mean by this minus is it is not necessary. There's one thing these people will not take, they will not accept, and that is the idea that the works are necessary. That's the battle word. That's the code term. You tell these people that it is necessary for you to engage in acts of obedience to Jesus Christ or you are not justified, they will be fighting mad. Now, some of them are capable, in spite of their anger at this point, of listening academically, as it were. Now, I remember once I was with a group out there in, in Colorado, a group of very bright young people and discussing this in connection with the Reformation. They were sharpies. They were college students and bright ones engaged in conservative Christian work. And for about two hours in one of the classes, we didn't do anything but just discuss this one point. I was maintaining works are absolutely necessary if you are to be saved. And they were fighting me every inch of the way but before the thing was over, they finally realized, and it was very hard to admit it, that they really did agree with me, yes. And this is what I was showing to them. See, the reason they resisted it, the reason all fundamentalists uh, uh, who do resist it resist it is because they think that when you say the works are necessary, you th they think that you necessarily assume that they are contributing to your justification. And I was saying to them, no, no, no. Justification is by faith alone, but the Bible is insisting that faith without works is dead. This is, in other words, a working faith. It's faith, but it's a true faith. It's a working faith. And if it isn't a working faith, there's no justification. If those works are not there, not contributing to justification, but a definite expression of the reality of the faith, which is a working faith, then it's not a working faith. It's a dead faith, 
And if it's a dead faith, no one is going to be justified by a dead faith. As I say, it took two hours of grinding, careful, close analysis, what the students used to call being put on the hot seat by Gerson. I just made them think it through, and they were not willing for a moment to say when they once faced it that it was possible for an individual to believe truly in Jesus Christ unless he was giving evidence of it. And once they got it clearly in their mind that that's all that we're saying that's involved in faith, true faith, it has to be working faith so that work is there, and if the works are not there, this isn't here. If that isn't there, this isn't here, and this isn't here. You see how very important this is. You see, as I say, I always feel kind of tenderness toward my conservative friends who differ here. On the other hand, I get even angrier with them because, than I do with the liberals because the liberals are lost souls. They're just out in no man's land. They don't conjure with the Bible at all. But here are people who live and die by the Bible. Nevertheless, teaching something which actually cuts a heart out of the cross. Here again, I said about one as theologian here who actually will defend this sort of thing. His fundamental problem is he cannot understand the difference between necessary work and meritorious work. We are saying these works are necessary, not that they have any value in actually saving a person. They don't have any merit. The merit is all in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. And I say, if a person can't understand the difference between necessary works and meritorious works, he may be a Christian, but he ought never to be in a Christian pulpit. This is a false gospel. The idea that a person can be saved, and maybe I can squeeze this one remark in before we have to end this lecture just to show you how this thing can be carried out realistically in dreadful deeds that are associated nevertheless with a true Christian state. One time when I was lecturing at a Christian college, I won't mention because I don't think the college believes this or champion this at all. Nevertheless, I was more or less on this subject and somebody somewhere or other got a note, a th sort of three by five card, circulating up to me, some very circuitous route had ultimately gotten the dean's hand up on the platform, and even while I was speaking, it was given to me, and this is what it said. Apparently, I was supposed to read it while I was lecturing. Somebody was registering a vivid protest. This is what it said. I am having sex with this girl every day. I'm not married with her. I'm having sex with her every day. I have been born again by the Holy Spirit, and I have the joy of the Lord in my life. See? Because he was justified by faith. The fact that he was living in open defiance of the will of God, showing by his avowed behavior that he didn't have any faith at all, because he was living on this proposition that it was possible to have faith without any works, he not only devoid of works, but actually practicing the grossest kind a violation of the commandment of Jesus Christ was yet wanting me to know he had been born again and he had the joy of the Lord in his heart. That's just how serious this thing can be. Now, obviously, a person like that has not been born again. He is not justified by faith. If he doesn't repent, he will most certainly perish. God grant that none of you will fall into any such trap as this.